the Mad Colonel. That's what the Germans nicknamed John Frost, who still clung on to a handful of buildings at Arnhem Bridge. Frost's men fought desperately, with their ammunition running out and the houses collapsing and burning around them. Where was 30 Corps? Where were the tanks? They were eight miles to the south, fighting against the 10th SS Panzer Division, who were clinging on to the bridge at Nijmegen. Both Frost and 10th SS Panzer would fight two mirrored last stands as the outcome of Operation Market Garden hung in the balance. Who would fall first? <laughs> Yesterday was truly a dark and fateful day. The British forces trying to get to Frost men at Arnhem were almost wiped out, having been caught in a crossfire. The rest of 1st Airborne were pushed off their landing zones as General Urquhart, now back in charge of the division, tried to form a coherent defence. 30 Corps had reached Nijmegen, making up for lost time, but were stopped as the 82nd had failed to take Nijmegen Bridge. The Germans at Nijmegen were now under siege but held on despite Allied attempts to break through. The 101st had helped build a Bailey Bridge at Sonne in the morning, but fought to hold it in the evening against Panther tanks of Panzer Brigade 107. It was now the 20th of September, a Wednesday, day four of Operation Market Garden. The tanks should have reached Arnhem yesterday, but they hadn't. 30 Corps was still eight miles from Arnhem, and Nijmegen Bridge was still in German hands. But if they could break through now, there was a chance of victory even at this late stage. 10th SS Panzer Division held onto Nijmegen and the bridge with perhaps 500 men, backed by assault guns, 88mm guns, mortars and artillery. When the British set up for their attack, artillery rained down on them and stopped them in their tracks, just like the day before. Attempt after attempt was made to smash through the German defenders, but Kampfgruppe Henk and Uhling, under the command of Kampfgruppe Reinhold, fought them off. The stiffness of the German defence in Nijmegen throughout the day didn't seem to be weakening, so the Allies decided that only a desperate action could save the day. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Sherman's blasted the opposite side of the Vol as Major Cook's 3rd Battalion paddled in boats across the river. This was perhaps the most heroic and daring act of World War II as American paratroopers stormed across a river in boats, assaulted a riverbank like Marines, which they weren't trained for, just to take the Nijmegen Bridge from the other side. Unbelievably, under a hail of rifle, machine gun and mortar fire, half the boats made it to the north bank. As the boats turned back to pick up the next wave of troops, American paratroopers overwhelmed the old men and young boys who'd been killing them moments before. This was a decisive tactical victory for the Allies, which unhinged the German defence completely. The Germans had nothing left. There were so few units to form a defensive line that the Americans, supported by British sappers, were able to secure the beachhead and press on towards the Nijmegen Bridge. Yes, you don't hear that often, but the American paratroopers were accompanied by British sappers. And the crossing was a joint effort. They managed to get to the northern end of the Nijmegen Bridge, and as they did, four Sherman tanks from the British Grenadier Guards attack from the south. The tanks moved across the span of the bridge, killing the Germans in the girders. Just to point out another myth of this battle, the Germans in the girders were most likely engineers, not snipers as often described. They were perhaps trying to rig the bridge to blow, but nobody's quite sure. After the war, Harmel was convinced that there weren't snipers on the bridge. Either way, it was at this point that SS Colonel Harmel decided to blow the road bridge. His orders from Field Marshal Model were to keep the road bridge intact so Germany could launch counterattacks in the future. This was a unrealistic eventuality since Germany had little offensive capability left and Harmel understood that if he blew the bridge now it would prevent the Allies from getting to Arnhem. As the British Sherman tanks crossed the bridge he ordered the bridge to blow, but by some miracle, the explosive failed to go off. Lucky though the British were that the bridge was now in their hands, they were unable to advance. The four tanks that had gone to the other side of the Val were alone. The few American paratroopers they had with them weren't willing or able to advance. It's often been said that an American paratrooper became angry at the British tankers for not advancing with them to Arnhem. This is fiction. Another myth of the battle made up after the event. In fact, the American paratroopers may have even left the tanks at the bridge to go and fight the Germans elsewhere. What is certain is that a handful of American paratroopers who'd linked up with the tanks were too few in number to go on and in any event were in no position to take orders from the British. Their orders were to hold the other side of the bridge 
and it was now up to the British to advance. Unfortunately, without infantry support, the British tanks would be unable to advance. So where were the British infantry? 30 Corps has often been accused of being too slow after the capture of Nijmegen Bridge, but the reality was that the British infantry and tanks were still fighting against the Germans who held on at Nijmegen. They couldn't just leave a good portion of the 10th SS Panzer Division there sitting in their rear. Some of the German defenders, seeing the successful amphibious assault, decided to flee across the railway bridge, with around 250 dying on the bridge itself. The Germans lost control of the Nijmegen Railway Bridge, but fighting continued in the city. Artillery fire rained down on the British, preventing them from overwhelming the last pockets of resistance. Holding on for a few more hours, the Germans finally realized their position was hopeless. Some once again tried to flee across the bridges, now in enemy hands. Others, such as survivors of Camp Group Uling, who'd held onto Hunter Park, managed to slip under the Nijmegen Road Bridge and escape to the east. The British wouldn't clear the last elements of resistance from Nijmegen until the early hours of the next day, and it wasn't until Nijmegen was secure that the British infantry and the rest of 30 Corps could have continued their advance to Arnhem. So why was it at the time and after the war that 30 Corps was accused of being so slow? Why were they accused of drinking tea on the northern end of the Nijmegen Bridge whilst their comrades at Arnhem were left to bleed? We'll come back to that question in the last episode of the series, but I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments below. As the fighting came to a head in Nijmegen, things further south weren't easy either. As the morning mist cleared at Son, the Americans guarding the Bailey Bridge that had been built on the previous night could be forgiven for thinking they'd done their part. The day before, they'd stopped the German counterattack, which had nearly got to the bridge, and could be satisfied that they completely secured the line. They were wrong. Panzer Brigade 107 achieved complete surprise by attacking the exact same way they'd done the day before. You see, the Germans never attacked in the same place twice, it just wasn't done. In theory, if you attack the same place twice, the enemy, well, will be prepared. That was why the Germans never did it, but that's exactly why they did it this day, to throw the Americans off guard. It wasn't long before they dominated the Bailey Bridge with fire once again. However, in the nick of time, 10 British tanks appeared, and managed to destroy four more German tanks and turn the tide of the battle in their favour. Unable to take the bridge, Panzer Brigade 107 withdrew. It had once again been close to cutting the Allied corridor. This wasn't the only attack on the corridor this day. 406th Division, which had attacked out of the Reichswald Forest near Grusbeek two days ago, was finally reinforced. Volksjamega, German paratroopers, perhaps a few hundred strong, joined the already weak 406th Division and now formed three Kampf Group. Kampf Group Becker, with perhaps 800 men, would strike Grusbeek on the northern end of the battlefield and aim to take the Mars Weil Canal. Kampf Group Greshnik, with perhaps 500 men, attacked Grusbeek's centre. And Kampf Group Hermann was positioned in the south and would hope to strike through Mu and cut off the bridges on the Mars Weil Canal. Starting in the morning, by 11 o'clock, the battle raged for the Grusbeek Heights. Beek, Weiler and Mook fell quickly, and Kampf Group Greshnik's unit managed to take some of the outskirts of Grootspeak itself. But an American counterattack in the afternoon, supported by British tanks, forced the Germans back from Mook and Grootspeak, and the attack in the north was halted. This was the first serious attack on the Grootspeak Heights so far. It was four days after the operation had begun, and well after 30 Corps had arrived but at least the 82nd had four days to prepare themselves for the fight. It was only now, at the extreme northern end of the battlefield, that Urquhart came to the conclusion that he had to abandon the idea of relieving Frost in the bridge. To use his own words, With the weak force now left, I could no longer hope to reach Frost than reach Berlin. Later in the same day, he finally made contact with Frost over the radio. Urquhart told him he wasn't certain if it was a case of me coming for them or they coming for us. And so with 1st Airborne Division abandoning all hope of getting to Frost's beleaguered troops at Arnhem Bridge, they instead had to look for their own defence. Previous day's action had seen their attacking force in Arnhem decimated by the Germans. 1st Parachute Brigade no longer existed, and the remnants of several battalions fell back to Oosterbeek. The landing zones were overrun and supplies were now dropping to the Germans rather than to themselves. German tanks were pressing upon their lines. Urquhart decided the remaining units should fall back to positions immediately around Oosterbeek. He had to form a defence quickly before the remainder of the division was wiped out. Throughout the day, Urquhart tried to salvage what was left of the original market garden plan. If he could no longer get to Arnhem Bridge, he would hold Oosterbeek, 
and hopefully keep a crossing point open for 30 Corps. It was a desperate plan, but it might just work. The casualty list for First Airborne was staggering. It was no longer a division, but a few stragglers and small groups falling back to Oosterbeek. But if they could hold on to Oosterbeek and the Heathdorp Ferry, a Bailey Bridge could be set up across the Rhine and victory could still be clawed from the jaws of defeat. With this in mind, he told Corps HQ to change the Polish drop zone to Drill near the southern end of the ferry. If the Polish held the southern end of the river and the rest of First Airborne held the northern end, there was a chance that 30 Corps could still cross the Rhine. It was a desperate plan, but a plan it was. In the east, Kampfgroup Spindler crossed the railway lines and reached the east of Oosterby. To the west, Von Tetau's Kampfgroup pushed the British back from their drop zones and took Wolfhaze. 4th Brigade of the British Paris did manage to stall the attacks for a time, mauling part of Kraft's attack and even counter-attacked despite their orders saying to retreat. Hackett fought alongside his men, brandishing a German gun, trying to desperately get them back towards Oosterbeek. During the confused fighting in the woods, there was no real front line as such, just groups of units moving around, ambushing and sniping each other. Towards the evening, Hackett's remnants fell back to Oosterbeek and recognisable lines were finally formed. Both sides took sizeable losses in the day's fighting and this is perhaps the reason why Von Tetau decided not to deliver Coupe de Gras and destroyed the British pocket completely as they retreated, which some historians think may have been possible. Either way, by the evening of the 20th, the British pocket was formed at Oosterbeek and the fluid movement of the past few days ended. The siege had begun. These were first Airborne's dispositions at the end of the day, 20th of September 1944. 10th and 156th Battalions, who had fought their way back into Oosterbeek from the west during the day, were now guarding the eastern side of Oosterbeek that evening. This was because 1st, 3rd and 11th Battalions were so badly mauled they were merely scraps of the units they once were. Lieutenant Colonel Thompson took command of this force, which was nicknamed the Thompson Force, but Thompson was later wounded and from the 21st onwards, tomorrow, Major Lonsdale took command of this battle group, which was then renamed the Lonsdale Force. 21st Independent Parachute Company, together with the 7th Battalion King's own Scottish Borderers, held the northern end of Oosterbeek around Hotel Drayrud, a building soon nicknamed the White House. 9th Airborne Field Company and 1st Border held the western side of Oosterbeek and inside this ring were glider pilots who fought alongside the troops. The Royal Artillery, which was located towards the southern end of the pocket, and the Divisional HQ, which was located at the Hartenstein Hotel, continued to hold out. Little more than 3,600 men remained of First Airborne, and supplies of all kinds were running low. But Urquhart had successfully created a defence around Oosterbeek, even though it wasn't a complete ring and was more groups of soldiers dug in at strong points. Frost's position was now perilous. Movement was almost impossible, and the few buildings they had left on the western side of Arnhem Bridge were surrounded. Truces allowed the defenders to evacuate their wounded, which included their leader, Frost himself. They'd run out of everything. Food, water, ammunition. In fact, the Germans were also so low of ammunition that many of them resorted to using captured British rifles and Sten guns as their own logistics struggled to keep up. The shortcoming of the German supply system was alleviated by the Allied resupply drops, which, as we mentioned, were falling into German hands. The Germans blasted the British houses at the bridge at point-blank range, they had Tiger tanks at hand, including the latest shipment of Konigsteiger or King Tiger tanks. The lightly armed paratroopers had no effective countermeasures against these heavy German tanks. Luckily, rubble prevented German vehicles from manoeuvring with ease, but this only slowed the inevitable. There was only a handful of buildings left now, and many of them were on fire. So at half seven, the British and the Americans took the Nijmegen Bridge, but it would take all night to clear Nijmegen so they could continue the Northern attack. As this day comes to an end, we see the end of two sieges, Arnhem Bridge and Nijmegen. Elements of two power continued to hold just, but they had no influence over the bridge now. For both sides, it was now a race to engage each other in the area between Nijmegen and Arnhem, an area known as the island. We'll find out how that race goes tomorrow. If you could rate the video and let me know how I'm doing, that'd be great. Otherwise, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, bye for now.